room is uh, is packed, <laughs> crowded with uh, with people. So welcome to this, uh, as we say in the uh, in the domain of performing arts, this world premiere, uh, the first of a. Uh, I hope the first of a long series of uh, events that uh, are called Disputatio and organized by the Faculty of Philosophy and more specifically the School of Public Ethics here at St. Paul and even more uh, specifically by the research program that is called Critical Religion and Public Ethics. Um, this is the first Disputatio, Disputatio lecture, and it's an in initiative of uh, our colleague, Mark de Cazo. So I would like to thank him for uh, this initiative. No, that's uh, at the same time a commitment, because it's just the first of the uh, long <laughs> series to come. So. <laughs> Uh, it's just a, a hint, you know. So, uh, Marc has uh, <laughs> and, uh, given the following title to his uh, presentation tonight, Breaking Gods, Monotheism and, slash, as, Religion Critique. And uh, there will be a response by uh, Professor Sean McGrath uh, from uh, Memorial University. So, we are very pleased to have you tonight. Uh, Dr. McGrath, and welcome. And without much ado, so I will uh, give the, uh, all the place to our speaker. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. Thank you for coming here and to make a strong disputatio of it, because that's the aim of the, of, of the series of conferences that we discuss about religion. And I, I mean it because um, that, that has something to do with the thesis I want to defend here. Religion and discussion, religion and disputatio, is not simply a kind of medieval practice, because in medieval times, professors were obliged to organize disputationes, disputa disputatio, that means kind of open discussions, not only for the inner circle of the university, but more broad, and then there was really an, 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 a tradition of rethinking in medieval times, a bit, a bit contrary to what we might think about medieval times. In the university, there was kind of close, very free uh, spirit there. And I, want, and, and I took the Disputatio title as in, introducing kind of discussion on religion because I think, and that's my thesis, religion and discussion have, has a kind of inner, um, inner uh, relation to one another. Religion, and that's, I, I will I present you my new version of PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> it's brand new, it's, uh, it's advanced, you know, it's, uh, it's material, it's singular. Would you need that? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you see that, um, um, well, I want, to, first of all, I, I, just to say, I will speak 30 minutes, no longer than you, you have to time enough to, to have a response, and then it's to the public, it, the public it's, it's open for the disputatio as such. Um, what is my thesis? My thesis is that I, I'm, I'm taking a position against the most general definition of religion that is shared by everyone, almost, believers, non-believers, whatever, uh, and whoever is talking about religion, they are talking about faith. And they accept all the pros and the contrast, they accept all that. Religion is not so much about rational thinking, it's not so much about criticism, but it's about having faith in it, which always is uh, somewhere or another beyond rationality, beyond uh, discussion, beyond critical thinking. That, that's, that's the main opinion here. And I want to go against that a bit, because if you look at the tradition, not the very recent tradition, the tradition which of the, the last two centuries, and I will explain, if you look at the post-Kantian tradition from 1800 on, then that goes. Then we think religion is fate. And fate is that what you accept without really scientifically knowing it. But if you look at the big tradition, at the large tradition, then you must 
conclude, at least that's my thesis, that it is impossible to have faith in God without critically, without organizing criticism, exactly concerning your faith. So faith and criticism, which has been one and another, the, the opposite in modern times, originally, faith and criticism go together. I cannot believe in God for, for the monotheistic tradition, and I, I mean the Bible, the, 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 the most original tradi text tradition in monotheism. I cannot believe in God when I am not at the same time believing in God, very critical about what? About my belief. Why? And it's very simple. It, 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 it's almost, it's almost, it's almost uh, commonplace, because only God is God. And since only God is God, that means that I have the inclination, the intention, to, to suppose to be God what I think God is. The one who comforts me, the one with whom I feel safe, the one who is my last, my last ground. Of course, it can be. But it is in, the monotheistic tradition says I have to do that after and while criticizing my images of God. That's why there is a long tradition in Christianity and also in Jew Judaism and even in Islam. There's a long tradition of the names of God. The names of God. Can, can even God have a name? Because what's the name of God? Other than a kind of appropriation of what escapes all appropriation. That's why I need critical thinking. And I will explain that a bit. I will say, uh, why is that so? I will explain what the thesis is, why this is important to know that, and secondly, uh, or thirdly, what this has to do with the relation of modernity and religion. Because I, my point is a bit that the discussion is always the discussion that religion has some way or another relation with modernity, and modernity is always in conflict with that religion. As if religion, that, 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 that's understandable, as if religion is something not really modern. And I think that religion, monotheistic religion, and I mean Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, are not that far away from the project of modernity. So they have a kind of, of, of link with modernity, an inherent link with modernity, because they are a critical tradition, and because modernity is impossible without a strong critical tradition. Modernity is the way of free thinking, and free thinking needs criticism, and not, not only an individual criticism, because of course I can think what I think, but precisely therefore, because I can think what I think, I need a kind of tradition, a kind of, of partners, a kind of, of, of way that has been traced itself, of tradition, in that criticism. Because I, I myself, I am too poor to, to, to organize my own criticism. Of course I'm free. But freedom needs tradition. That's a bit the background. To, in, to install really moder modern uh, modernity, to install a kind, of, um, a kind of behavior for modern man, we have to rethink our relation to tradition. So modernity is, uh, is impossible without tradition, which is, I, I see Sophie, which is a kind of Arendtian thinking. Arendt stress it. We, we, cannot, we cannot be... And we cannot do modern politics without historical, traditional background. It, 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 otherwise, we have a kind of, um, of hist hysteria in, in, our, in our being free from, from everything. So, that's the thesis. First of all, um, I will explain um, a bit why we have nowadays since Kant, since the since since German idealism, or, or since the the, the 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 Enlightenment, we have the definition of religion as fate. Where does it come from? Okay. I, I'm, I'm, I I will, uh, will argue against it, but it's not a stupidity to say that. It, it, there is, there is a rational behind it, which is very intelligent and which is very comprehensible. What is the origin of fate? I already said it, the origin of the definition of religion as faith is Kantian, because Kant solved the problem. 
You must know that before Kant, before the Enlightenment, religion was there, but not defined as fate, of not solely defined as fate. Religion was there to be the, 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 the idea that gives foundation to our relation to the world. Science in medieval times was based in religion. Not in religion as such, not in religion as practice, but God was the one who has given us reality. We were given that reality by God, we were given to that reality by God, and the giver of that givenness, that was God. So, Thomas Aquinas starts his vision on the world, his explanation scientifically of the world, with God. And so did, also, in the 70s, in the 70th century, Spinoza. You have to start with the foundation. And as I explained it in, in other occasions, God was the subject, was the point from where you start in your relation to the world. Modernity is the time that that starting point, God, the giver of the givenness of the world, has changed. We can no longer accept, we can no longer start in our relation from the world from the givenness and from the goodness that has given us the world. That's modernity. That's the card. That's the doubt about everything. I have to, that's the card. I can doubt and I have to doubt in the most, in the most far, far going way there is. I have to doubt about everything. And there I meet, what do I meet? Myself. As being the subject, the new subject, the new starting point in my relation to the world, that is myself as a free thinker. I'm free from the world. You know, that's modernity. We are free from the world. The world has become a kind of mechanical, dead uh, thing that, that moves. But the soul of the world, maybe there is a soul in the world, but that's no, not important. The Newtonian physics uh, treated reality as kind of superficial, it's kind of materiality which has no soul at all. That, that's modernity. We are free from that, and that's why we can do everything with it. We can do everything with, with reality. We can make PowerPoints, and we can even declare this a PowerPoint. That's freedom. You know, that, that's no problem. That's, and that's why modernity is the age of imagination. Well, it's not so much the age of your reality, it's the age of imagination. We have a kind of distance towards reality, because we are on our own, you know? But you feel the problem, being on our own, we have not made ourselves. We know that. And that's why God is, is involved. We, have, we are free from reality, but we have not made ourselves. There is, some, there is something like, as, as Rousseau says, l'auteur des choses, the, the, the author of things. Things have some ground. But we do no longer approach the things that, which have a ground from that ground, but from ourselves. That's why the big problem about in modernity is the subject, is, is we, that's it. And that's why all ideology is about we. That's why modern ideology is as, as ideological as religious ideology in the Middle Ages. That's why we often use reference to religion to the Middle Ages as being as dark, that people were not still stupid believers, and we are very realistic, we are in reality, which, which is of course nonsense. We, we, are, we are human beings trying to, to figure out how to deal with reality. And we have changed paradigms. That, that's all we have done. Why has religion become a fate? Because God was no longer subject, no longer the basic supposition in our relation to the world. And so that new base was our freedom. And so we were free to believe in God or not. That's, God became object instead of subject. That's modernity. That's another another and more precise version of what they call uh, as definition of modernity to be the death of God. God cannot die, he is immortal, but God can, is no longer subject. He is object. And that's why we are still, and that's a bit the background of our interest in religion, we are still busy with, with God. By, in the sense of Defending him, or on the other way around, in defending the thesis that God doesn't exist. They are both militant. They are theists, atheists, but there is there is something with it. And politically, in in, uh, in all kinds of fundamentalism, they fight for it. They fight for from the subject position for an object that always deals with the the, the fragility of that subject position. What does Kant? 
can't solve that. Because Kant says, you can believe in God, you can have a relation with God, but you cannot have that old relation, which is, as they call it in philosophy, an ontological relation, a relation that is to the, to the source and to the ground of being, that's impossible. I don't know what the ground and the soul of things is. That's impossible. I don't know if I don't I can I cannot organize my science from the one who has made things as they are. That's God. So science is without God. Theology is nonsense for Kant. The theology is Schwärmerei. That's clear. But since I'm a free man, since I have my thinking is free, I can believe that things have an origin, that things are made by a source by an intention which is almighty and good. That makes sense. And there are many reasons to, to believe that, but I cannot scientifically prove that. So Kant is responsible for the fact that, indeed, we can believe in God, but we cannot no longer have a science of God. He is responsible for the new definition of religion as fate, to accept what is scientifically not provable at all. That, that, that's, and we understand immediately when we hear the word fate, we understand immediately that this is not science. And that's, that's the reason why religion still is precisely a kind of atmosphere, a kind of area in which we prove our freedom. Certainly in North America, you, the churches are everywhere in the name of freedom. American is, has been created as a, the new Jerusalem, as a new land of a free religion. You know, that, that's modernity. The question, is, the question now is, what is wrong with that? What is wrong with the fact that, indeed, God is no longer the subject? Fantastic. We are free, and so we believe in God. So, what's the problem? The problem is, it's rather simple. It's the, 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 the problem is the following. What we have done with that move, that solves a lot, we have um, abstracted critical thinking from religion. And there is, there is a ruse underneath it. We have thought that we can have a relation to truth, which is God, but without being forced scientifically, critically, rationally, to think about what is truth. That means that I can have a, tr a relation to truth which escapes my rational critical thinking. And that means that, indeed, I have access to a truth about which I do not have to discuss. That's, that's, that's the religious crisis. The religious crisis, that's why religion is in crisis. Because everyone can believe what he wants. And that's, that's also it. What's going on? In the name of religion, we do not join together about, around one truth. No, no, we all believe in the truth we want, but we don't discuss about this truth. It means that everyone has its own truth and no one can discuss about it. So that's why religion is a kind of false truth claim that escapes from discussion about truth. And that's why it can not, not necessarily, but it can take the shape of one who, in the name of truth, fights the whole world without any discussion. Fundamentalism is one of the, the most um, explicit shapes, forms of that position. I know the truth and I don't have to think while defending that truth to think critically about that truth. If you look at tradition, that's never been the case. Tradition has always been a kind of rational, um, rational defen de de uh, defense of that of that faith, and also a critical defense of that faith. So we have escaped truth, critical thinking from Christianity, which is why we have lost our relation to tradition. That's it. So it's faith. That's my thesis. Don't believe me, but that's my thesis. Huh? <laughs> but I, I think that it's fate, it's a, the, the reduction of religion to fate, which is the which is really the the cause of the 
the crisis in the region. So the problem is not that people do no longer believe. The problem is that people believe. That's a problem <laughs> for monotheism. That's a problem. Because they can believe everything. And they have, they have lost the tool to discuss about it. Because there is no doctrinal uh, claim of truth. So everyone has his own religion. Everyone has his own group of school, and then the discussion ends nowhere. So that's why I think that loss of critical spirit in religion is responsible for the fact that religion is no longer able to participate at that modern project, which is modernity. It lost it. And that's why it, 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 it subverts modernity by a kind of non-critical, non-reflected truth claim, which you see in fundamentalism. That's why the monotheistic religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, for Judaism it, it, it counts less because Judaism has a very strong um, critical tradition. Read the Talmud. It's, it's, you, 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 of course there's a truth, but you never know it, and you have to think about it. It's a very rational religion, but we have to, to, to think in, in a certain way to, to have connection again with that critical tradition. And then I think things will change, then we can do what we, I think, Christianity, Islam, and a monotheistic religion. And th this goes also, but I, I escaped that in, in, my, in my paper, Bo uh, uh, Buddhism, which is also a critical religion. That they can participate to a modern project. And I think this is this is incontournable. The, the background of my of my paper is the the the, the idea of uh, Rimbaud and Baudelaire. Il faut être absolument moderne. Modernity, that's a kind that's history. We are modern. And we have to think modernity. And we you, you, you can you cannot step out of, of your historical condition. That's our condition. We have to deal with that. We are post cartesians We are free, and in that freedom we have to embrace it and think that. that that and to take our responsibility for a world which is free. How difficult, from a certain point of view, that whatever that is, how difficult that is. So what's wrong with it? The loss of critical spirit, which is necessary to participate to modernity, and that's the. At, at least at my point, that's the, the ground of the, of the religious cri uh, um, crisis we are in. That's why we have to go back, and I will be very short, but it's, it's a long history, you know, but, but I will just give the, the outlines of, of an argumentation. But we have to go back to, the, to monotheism. We have to, we, have, we have to reconsider the fact that Christianity, Islam, Judaism, that we are monotheists and we have to redefine monotheism and monotheism is to define and now I go very fast but um, it's, it's not about the fact that monotheism is not the opposite of polytheism polytheism is a word uh, coined by David Hume in the 80, in the uh, 80th century monotheism is a word coined by in, in the time of Jesus beginning of our, of our, of our um, that time. And monotheismos means, um, uh, is to be defined as a religion in which has been introduced the notion of truth. That's it. That's the big difference between normal religion, as, as I once called it, non-religious of religious religion, Roman religion, Greek religion, those are those are real religions. Compared to that, monotheism is, is not really a real religion because truth has been introduced there. Because the the basic notion there is there are false and true gods. And since truth is one, there can only be one truth and one God. And so this means that all religion, all religious gods, all centra of religious life are false. You see, criticism is at the core and at the origin of monotheism. It, without criticism, there is no monotheism because truth is there. And it, it origins from the same time as that other big regime of truth, which is the philosophical tradition. 
I, I will uh, uh, show you now that the origin of monotheism is not that old. It has no. It, it has. It has some something to do with old ancient history. But it. it the the origin of monotheism is the sixth century, no before. It's the sixth century, century, and on one place it has its origin in Babylon. Not even in Jerusalem, not even in Egypt, it has its origin in Babylon. So monotheism is the introdu introduction in religion of truth. That means that a non-monotheistic religion has no truth. And that's difficult for us because we are so we are so in we are so um, um, so swimming in that in that regime of truth that we cannot think without without reference to truth. <coughs> Postmodernity has tried that to do. Postmodernity has think has taught the idea that we we can go beyond truth, but this was an absolute truth. If, if you if you say there is no truth, the, the moment you say that, this is the absolute truth. You, you you are in you are in the truth. Whatever you, it's, it's, but if you study ancient religions, that's different. The Roman has a relation to the world, and truth is there, but in the margin. Of course, there is a bit of truth, but it does not organize its relation to the world. Monotheism, a very small tradition in the sixth century before Christ, has introduced truth in religion and has become, in the fourth century after Christ, with Constantine. Thanks to Christianity, has become the, the 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 new paradigm to think religio, religion, Roman religion, and that Roman religion has conquered the world. That's why that Christian religion of us is is basically Roman. And all all of, of, of Christianity is, is is influenced by Rome, not because of the truth, but because of the religion. Original monotheism. It's not Roman, it's not religious. Uh, original monotheism is introduction of truth. And that's why um, that religion is what I call here a non-religious religion. That means, and, um, that means that that kind of monotheism that has made history has distanciated himself from religion. There was a first monotheism, just to, to, to mention it very quick, in the 14th century before Christ. That's Akhenaton. That's uh, Amenhotep the, the, the fourth. And the, the most, the most glorified uh, time of, 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 of Egypt, he declared for the first time, and it's a, it's a rational revolution, he declared all other gods almost non-existent, false. Except one god, Atom, who was the one God? But did this last ten years, and it went, and it was still a religion. That means I had to build up a kind of commerce relation with that God, because in a real religion, the gods live from what they get from the people. the The paradigm to understand real religion is not faith. The Greek did not believe in their gods, nor did nor did the Romans or the Akkadians. It's not really. It's it's a gift relation. I have, I have been given life, and I have to give back something to the gods. That means worship, sacrifices, ceremony, ceremonies, uh, um, processions, and so on. That, and that, that, that's why the gods uh, are kept interested in us, and that's why we are given life again and again. So that, that religion is a commerce, which, which is still in our religion. When I pray for a saint, then I get something. Right? When I lost something, I pray for Saint Anthony, and he he will give it back. That that that's religion, but that's not the core of monotheism. Monotheism said, Yahweh God says, I do not like your sacrifices. You should you should do other things than sacrifice me. That that's the point. What should I do to understand that? I must explain a bit the change in religion in that particular little people, which are the Hebrews, who has invented monotheism in a certain way, after a long history, of which I will make now a very short report, but it's interesting because the origin of monotheism is, is to, be, to be situated in a trauma of the history of that people. 
Monotheism is the result of a religion that almost was on the verge of disappearing. A religion which, which was in that time a culture, their way of life, the way they treat to life and gods and, 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 and the divine and the, the mortal and the immortal, that way of living was almost disappearing because the people was disappearing. And it's in that trauma that they reshaped their tradition into the monotheistic tradition. That's why I have to... I have a second PowerPoint. <laughs> this is one of the PowerPoint with colors and all, you know. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, voila. So that's Akhenaton, hey, that's Egypt. That's not our monotheism. Maybe there is a link, but, but that's not sure. And Zelens said that in the beginning of the 20th century, Freud was uh, akin to that. Jan Asman, one of my sources, likes that too, but it's not sure. We don't have evidence about the relation between Hebrew monotheism and Egyptian monotheism. Although Moses is an Egyptian name and Moses was probably an Egyptian. All, all uh, points in that direction, which we have, we lack real, real convincing evidence. That are the facts of the Hebrew history. And the Hebrew, the, the to, to make it very short, because we have studied uh, enormously about it, but, but nonetheless, it remains history, it means this kind of blind, unknown thing about it. But there must have been, there must have been a kind of Yahwistic, and Yahweh is the name of, of God. There were two names of God. And there, but there must have been a kind of Yahwistic culture, religion, I, I, I hesitate to, to use the word religion because there was no religion. You must know religion is only a Latin word. There is no word for religion in Egypt, in Hebrew, in, in, uh, in, in Greek. In, um, it doesn't exist. Religio is only, it's in Hapax, it's only, it's only. The Greek do not, they never speak about religion because they have no word for that. Neither do the, do the, do the Hebrews, religio. That doesn't exist. So that culture is concentrated around that that the source of what has given God, the divine. And in the Hebrew tradition, there were not that many gods. That's a counter argument for the Egyptian tradition. In Egyptian, there is a multitude of gods, as in Hinduism. Not in, the, in that in that small Hebrew. There, there is two, three gods. Yahweh El, maybe it's only one, it's possible. But, but even if there is one God in that tradition, it's not still monotheism. But it's not about monotheism, of the mono, of, of the one that, that is at stake here. Um, that tradition has a kind of rationale who says that if you follow me, said that God, then I will give you, I will make of you a great people. This is not original. Because that, that's what that's what gods are aimed for. To make, to enforce the people, to make of the people great people. That's why the Romans love their Ares. That's why they have a Vesta cult and so on. It's the glorification of the nation, of the people. It's to glorify the source of, of life that has given me what I am. That was Yahweh, that was God, and that has his first, that has his first product in a state which is the state of. Uh, of the, 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 the 12 tribes of the Hebrews, the 12 sons of Israel, which is the name of Jacob, as you know. Um, and that is around 1900 before Christ. And that was a, a magnificent, succeeded tradition that went wrong, as many, as many traditions. There has been, in 900, there has been a division of the, the country forget to mention it, but in 900 there is a split of the country in a northern part and a southern part. The northern part is the most rich. Ten tribes of the twelve are northern part. That is, they have the name Israel and they have they are the victim of Assyrian aggression and they are they are deported to the north of Mesopotamia. That's the Assyrian exile. 
720. This is definitive. The ten tribes are gone. The Jewish uh, mythology, they will come back with the Messiah. The, 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 there are songs in, in the Jewish tradition who say that. But the starting point of monotheism, as we know it, is the second exile, the second exile of what they call the rest of Israel. It's a biblical term. But what left of, of Israel, that, ha that is the victim of another aggression of the Neo Babylonian Empire, who deported the population, of a great larger part of the population, to Babylon, where they were slaves. And it's by the rivers of Babylon, where they sat down and wept, Psalm 137, that they invented monotheism, in, that they give monotheism. The, the, the content that is still the paradigm of monotheism. And that they succeeded. Why? Because that exile has been temporary, not definitive. That exile stopped in 540 before Christ because, and we owe monotheism to that person guy, the, the king of Iran, of, of Persia, Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great conquered the new Babylonian Empire and he followed he he uh, followed another rule in his policy instead of breaking people this was Assyrians Babylonians deportation as Stalin did with the, with, with the Tartars no he, he as the Roman will do as, 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 as many will do he has a policy of peace you make people you you have a strong empire when the people feel at home in your empire. An authenticity policy he has. And he give all the occasions, not obligation, because most of the of the Jews, they stayed in Babylon until the 19th century, a huge community of, of, uh, of Jews in, in Babylon. But a large part of a la large part went back to Jerusalem to build up the city. And to what to take with them the culture that has been its origin here in that in that 40 years. What is happened there? It's there there is this is the effect of what they call a mourning, a travail de deuil. The, the, at, at the origin of, of Montism is a is a mourning labor. Travail de deuil. I don't know the English expression, but it will the 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 Duch Arbeitung ein Treue, eine Treue. Sag's mal in Deutsch. They say it in English the the elaboration of mourning. <laughs> mourning about what? About the destruction of their own culture. So the big question is here, the beginning of monotheism. The big question is where is God? Because He has promised us a land. Look at this. Weeping by the rivers of Babylon. We have nothing. And then they begin to think. And then they begin to try to save their tradition. And they said, oh, we have forgotten something. Because we thought that the promised land, that was a kind of political category. A kind of category which gives us politic, polit political glory. It's not the case. Because if we had listened to the prophets of the 8th and the 7th century, those who were in the Bible now, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and so on, then what we read there is the promised land is an ethical, so, socio-ethical category. What is a promised land? Where is done justice to the one who lacks justice. To the widow, the orphan, that's it. That was the the, the message, the content of a marginal, dissident voice in the 8th, 7th century, this became central in the 6th century. And they begin to make culture around those texts. That means even now here, without a temple, without a capital, without a country, without a king, we can realize what God meant by his promised land, by doing justice here. You see, a detour, an, 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 a distance about, uh, from the, the territory, about the political reality, and a kind of itazization, a kind of 
becoming ethical, social ethical of that, of, 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 of that content of that religion. And so, 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 and here you have it, there is a we. Who are we? What is our identity? Our identity is dominated by a mistake we made. We should have listened to the true God. And we had the true God, but we didn't understand the true God, because the truth of God is what the prophet says. And what is true religion? Not to serve gods, not to have big sacrifices in many temples. No, no. The true, the true religion is not to serve God and gods. The true religion is to serve the widow, the orphan, the one who lacks justice. The true religion is to install social justice. This is what the prophet says. You, you, we are far away from religion in a certain way. Because that's why Yahweh God doesn't like sacrifices and doesn't like religions. He allows just one temple. I know you just allowed in one temple and with one, one the, the, the priests are there, one family, you can do that. But that's not the aim of it. That's not the core of religion. The core of religion is social practice. You see, a kind of reorientation of religion back away from the transcendent commerce with the gods to the immanent relation in, in political social sense. And that's why we have our social our, our social commitment from, our social sensitivity from. We have it from that monotheistic tradition and we have it from the Romans, the Greek Romans, in our politic democracy. And the, the, the Greek in our the, the democratic politics and the Romans in our legal system. These are the basic of our society. That's why we, 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 should, we should be aware of that tradition. Our religion, that's the core of our religion. And, and that's why uh, the, the content of monotheism changed from religion to social ethical practice and religion itself changed from instead of sacrificing a, 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 what, they can, what you can call a kind of culture of words they began to sing express their mourning that's the Psalms God why have you left it the water is until here why are, where, where are you where are you God and so on that, that's the content and the answer is always you should not look at me you should look you should take care of the orphan and the widow you see there's that shift from God to man is the core of monotheistic religion you see why why it, it's strange to to define that as religion and that's why the Romans said and they were right from their perspective that the Christians and, and, and uh, Judaic people were atheists because they didn't respect gods. They were not busy with gods. They were, they were busy with social practice. Even the Christians, in the beginning, the Christians were, were having a proto-communism in, in, instead of, and they had, no, they had no altar, they had no practice. They, they, they were not really religious. For a Roman, this, this, this is horror. This is, how can be someone, uh, how can be some, uh, someone be a good citizen without being religious for the Roma this is impossible and that's why and that, that's another step central narrative of monotheism became the exile we are sitting in Babylon and they put forward that element in their tradition in which they were situated also in exile and in Egypt you know that, that's why so so in that period, they build up a kind of mourning tradition of a god, and they reinvented, they rediscovered the prophets. Afterwards, this has become the tradition of monotheism. And so, the, the tradition of monotheism is a critical tradition. You should not trust God. In, in, uh, I should not trust God. I made myself. Only God is God. That's why I need criticism. And to serve that God, I have not to do religion, I have to serve mankind, humans. You know, that, that, that's the difference. That, that's the core of monotheism. And that's what, we, that's what has made history afterwards, after Cyrus the Great. And then if you follow it, you see, I don't know if you look 
at the monotheistic tradition. And I, I should, I, if you read the Bible, just open it and you see that. You just what I say, if you open it, if you read whatever, if you read the Psalms, if you read um, the, 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 the historical texts, if you read the Pentateuch, it's always the same. Yahweh says he is there. You're worshipping false gods. Destroy them. Break the gods. That's religion. And instead of worshipping gods, you must do justice to the one who lacks, to the orphan and the widows. That's, that's the main point. And that's why, uh, just to, to say a few words about this, the book of Job, which is the most enigmatic book in the Bible, the most readable also, because it's, it's a late book, it's, it's, you, you feel already a kind of rational thinking in it, the Greek tradition, you feel it in it. It's one story. It's not a collection of stories from ancient times. It's a new story. It's, it's fiction of a man called Job who has been the object of a testing of God. Because the, uh, in the book of, 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 of Job, the, the core of monotheistic religion is questioned as such. Because what says monotheistic religion, and I have to add something to that core of monotheism, to serve myself, to serve me, God says, you do not have, I do not need sacrifices, I do not need gifts, I can live without your gifts, because I'm only giving, there is a, a logic of gift behind it, which, 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 has, which has huge consequences. God owes, God has n need nothing, which is, which is not the case with, with the Greek gods. The Greek gods need sacrifices. If, if you do not offer to Joyce, it's not good, because Joyce needs that. The, 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 the Greek gods, they live, as human did, they live from the pharma. They live from the fact that they are recognized. They are in that mutual recognition, not God. If the whole world says, if the whole world denies God, the truth remains truth. You know, that, that's a truth regime. And the, 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 the book of, of Job is questioning that, because that God who needs no sacrifices, he, he uh, obliges me, he commands me to do justice to the widow and the... And the and the orphan, this is what they call the law. The basic, the basic religious paradigm in the early monotheism is the Torah, is the law. You have to follow my law. And if you follow my law, then I will make of you a big people, a great people. Because that remains. We are, there's no heaven here. Heaven is, an, is a Greek idea. There's no immortality. I believe in God because God will make of me being the son of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he will make of me a big people, a great people. That's it. There's no heaven. There's no soul, no eternity. That's Greek. That comes in at the late uh, biblical writings. And so, the book of Job is questioning precisely that. Because the book of Job uh, performs a man of justice, a man who is in direct line with God, a man who does what the law asks from him. That means a man who deals with everyone, who makes, who gives justice to the one, to the weak in, in, in society, who makes good life, many feasts, many wine, rich. That's the aim of life. For, for there's no ascetism in, in the early monotheism. I should, I should, we should be rich because we have, we have to be rich people, thanks to God, and thanks to the fact that we follow the law. Job follows the law. And on instigation of the, the devil, Satan, he has taken away all his good things. He's get poor, he's get sick, and he he sits there in objected, left by everyone. And then he opens his mouth, and it, for more than 30 um, poems, from 30 uh, chapters long, he is cursing God. He is saying that God... What is he doing? He's saying that religion is nonsense. God is not what he is. God is not the one who gives me justice when I'm following the law. And he discusses with friends, and those friends says, no, God is just, and 
at you, you must have done something wrong. Job says, I'm not a saint. I've done, I've done things which are not, but, but I have done what, with the best intentions what I can. And everyone, everyone my, my neighbor, he does not respect the law, and he is rich. I have, I'm, I'm much more in, in obedience to the law, and I am in unhappiness. That means God is unjust. Big discussion, disputatio, biblica, in the, in the heart of martyrism. The fact is that the friends left him. And then he speaks directly to God. And then we have that famous answer of God. He says, he, he, he calls for a trial of God. God, come along here and defend yourself. And then God speaks. He says, nothing really, nothing new. He shows his majesty. I have made you. Who are you? Where were you when in the in in, in the uh, in the in the nothing out of which I created reality? Where were you, guy? It was, it was nothing. But Job keeps silence. He accepts it. And afterwards, he he he, he accepts it and he says, I, I cannot up against you. So, the book of Job is a kind of rediscovery of of. of in that tradition of God, which is escaping what a man thinks he is. Not what you think God is as God, only God is God. And what is the most strange thing, that is at the end of the book of Job, God restores all wealth to Job. And he says to the friends who has defended God uh, face, uh, facing Job, he says to the friend, you, you have spoken wrong about me. You should listen to my friend Job, because he, he is a good man. If you want to speak about me, speak as him. That means, speak as the one who is full of curses, who has, uh, who has um, treated God as kind of, uh, uh, who has questioned God as such. That means that, and that's, I, I will end with, with that, and few words on, on, on that question, but in the center of the monotheic tradition, and that's I think the main point of my thesis here, in the center of the monotheic, monotheistic tradition, there is no an answer to a question, there is a question. I think that it goes for every culture. I think we make the mistake in a kind of superficial idea of enlightenment that we know the, the, the answers to the question. Although we know all that we do not know that. Nobody knows the answer to, 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 to what man is. What is man? Man, 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 is, man is more a question than an answer. And all culture, including modernity, are built around questions. What is free man? What, we are free, but, but what, what the hell is that? We are busy in, in every, every single, every day of the year we are busy with, with, with what we are. We are built, culture is built around the question. Here you see that in monotheism. Monotheism is built around the question that true tradition, that true tradition is built around not an affirmation of truth, but a question which is shaped by the truth claims as such. You need some truth, but you need at the same time a critical thinking, thinking that keeps awake your questioning, which is the basic of your truth claim. And in monotheism, there is that tradition that the question is kept fresh. The, the question is kept there. That's also in Islam, so. That's, that, that's precisely the true traditions must keep alive their, their questioning tradition. When you reduce religion to an answer to your questions, then you lose a very important aspect of your religious tradition which make it indeed incompatible or dangerous with regard to the modern tradition. And so, precisely our fight with God, which is a fight with the question, has to be retaken in modern times. Because, and, and I will end with that, because the, the basic name of the monotheistic tradition is Israel. Israel is the name of Jacob. In, in Genesis, I think... Uh, Chapter 32, 
where Jacob is fighting with an angel, they, they translate, or with a man in the night, in the dark of the night, he's fighting with a man, totally alone, don't know with whom he is fighting, until he, he just has the experience that it's not simply a man, and he, he just has the suspicion this is God. And then he, Jacob asked, sign me, give me, uh, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, and then God only blesses after having changing his name. And then Jacob became Israel. Israel means, that's the first name for what we call monotheistic religion, tradition, because monotheism was not a word at, at that time. But Israel means the one who has fought with God and man and who has survived. So Isr, the, 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 germ, the, Hebrews, the Hebrew word Isr means fighting with, be in tension with. That's the core of the tradition. Be in tension with what remains a question. It's a kind of culture questioning. Just as modernity is a culture of questioning. And, and, and that's why tradition is important, because that question can only remain vivid when that question has its line of tradition. That, that question has its grammar, has its language. And in our multicultural landscape, we have to combine our, the, the, the multicultural landscape, not from the answers and respect to the answers. And, and I think this is the basic mistake we make, that we, we think we have to respect the answer. You believe in your God, I believe in my God. We will not discuss. No, no we must be in touch with, with one another's question. That's why we have to discuss with one another. Christianity has to discuss with the Islam. That, that, that's, in a certain way, that's the, the task of theologians. That, that, that's one of the tasks of the, they, they, we have to talk with about on the level of questions. It's time, isn't it? Yes, I guess time has come. Time has come? <laughs> As the Bible says. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you very much, uh, Marc, for this, um, uh, this uh, talk, uh, this uh, profound, rich, and uh, provocative talk. Uh, we will now uh, hear the... Uh, uh, Dr. McGrath responds to to uh, Professor De Kaisel's, uh thesis about monotheism. I just want to thank uh, Mark first of all for inviting me and for uh, for arranging this, and I'd like to say thank the Université Saint Paul for this brilliant idea of a disputatio. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and it's right up my alley. As is your thesis for the most part, so. Um, I'm completely in agreement uh, that the religion and modernity. <laughs> oh no, don't worry. We'll get to the disputatio in a moment. <laughs> that religion and modernity are not two, really. That this is a false uh, separation, and that in fact uh, we need to recognize uh, that what modernity lives out of uh, is peculiar to a particular historical religious tradition, which is the monotheistic religious tradition. Uh, and so there's a kind of false dichotomizing of uh, uh, the traditions of the West, let's say, and the modern world uh, that we have produced. In fact, uh, they are related as antecedent to consequent, you know, as, as ground to the being that it makes possible. So I'm entirely in agreement on this. Um, but I do have some concerns, uh, and, I, and, and I think they, it will take me some time to find my way through them. I'll just take 20 minutes. I, I'm not, this is not systematic. Uh, this is uh, exploration, exploratio. Uh, so uh, I, I have some uh, concerns here uh, with uh, uh, a few issues, so particularly um, the assumption that monotheism as such is adequate to Christianity. Uh, I think that Christianity is not monotheistic. I think it's Trinitarian. And I think that some of my remarks, uh, uh, well, I won't be able to develop that in any important way. The spirit of my remarks is coming out of that. Um, um, and then uh, I wonder also that uh, whether, you know, these, this uh, irreligious secularism or this non-religious modernism, non-religious monotheism that you've described for us, is it really all that different from what we actually have? I mean, is this not an argument to just sort of uh, affirm the wonderful uh, world that we have built 
the secular liberal world, uh, where uh, now churches are properly dedicated to social uh, and ethical work, and uh, we understand ourselves to be involved in something that's basically a humanistic enterprise. Uh, isn't this precisely uh, isn't this precisely why Islam despises us? <laughs> Because that's what we that's what we believe, right? And uh, we don't actually believe in God. We believe in something that is made possible by a belief in God, which is no longer really animating us. So I, I have some concerns that the, whether this gets us into the place of radical critique, which I think you want to bring us to. Um, <clears throat> So I, uh, first point is we must be modern. Absolutely, we must be modern. Uh, modernity, and, uh, there are so many different ways in which we can recognize that modernity is unsurpassable, uh, you know, a hist historical, hermeneutical way. Uh, but even from the perspective of, uh, let's say, a traditional Christian view, uh, every age is an age of the church, as Karl Barth said. So our godless secular modern age is an age of the church it's an age of the spirit yeah the spirit is speaking now in this uh, difficult uh, way and uh, we will not hear the spirit by uh, shutting our ears to the voices around us and retreating to some happy place I don't know the 13th century or something we can only hear it here so I'm entirely with you on this uh, however I'm not so sure about the modern the modernity that we've achieved and this is why the the the, the, uh, the conservative nature of what you said if I've interpreted you correctly, conservative in the sense that it's an affirmation of the modernity that we've achieved, I, I'm not so sure that that's uh, adequate. I would say that we must be secular, but in a new way. Um, there is a secularism that disavows uh, its religious ground, uh, and we need to find our way into a religious secularism. So instead of a non-religious monotheism, I would be, I'm interested in a religious secularism. And I think that this religious secularism would, is, a, is, a, is, is a Christian work. It's something that, it is, uh, something that really only Christian uh, thinking can make possible, a kind of transcendence, imminence. Uh, I think that the view that you've given us clearly uh, gives us something, to def a way of defending the immediate danger of fundamentalism. You know, a non-religious mon monotheism is obviously not going to be fundamentalist. But will it not, is it not in danger of becoming cynical? And I think that uh, the cynicism is as much a danger, I think, for moderns as fundamental, fundamentalism is. And in some important way, they're probably connected. <clears throat> yeah, so how do you find my way into this? Um, a few remarks, I think, is the best I can do. And we'll throw it open, uh, as I said, 15 minutes or so. Um, I was a little puzzled about this uh, this placing of Kant at the beginning uh, of the theological tradition uh, that Kant is the one uh, that defined faith for us. Um, I, uh, of course, everything uh, in a certain way modern begins with Kant, but faith, of course, is not is not believing in propositions that you lack scientific evidence for, maybe that's what it is for Kant, faith is trust in the promise. That faith has got a much more uh, robustly uh, dialogical uh, origin than that cognitive idea of faith. It's, faith is what I do when I don't have science or something, and therefore Kant says, you've got no science here, but faith is okay. This is a kind of modernistic, reductionist view of faith, which I think is not very interesting. Faith as trust in the promise is a dialogical faith that situates us in history in a different way. Uh, and I think that the difficult, there is another problem with faith, though, <clears throat> which is uh, and too much of a stress on faith. Uh, faith has to do with the past, really. Faith as trust in the promise has to do with the past. You know, what God has done, God will be faithful, so on. We really need uh, hope in the truth. And we need it now. And hope in the truth is, uh, uh, is, has to do with the future. Yeah? So a future-oriented uh, religious secularism is going to be a secularism that lives out of hope. And its enemy will not be fundamentalism. It will be cynicism. It will be cynicism that will undermine this religious secularism from within. Uh, and so uh, I, I was, for example, it, it, absolutely gripped by this passage from your paper, Mark. Uh, I don't have the page number, but I'll read it slowly. The core of Jewish monotheism, I quote Mark de Kessel, rather than being a belief in one God, may be seen as a subtle culture of disbelief, a culture distrusting the divine, the gods, the one God, and all other things we are inclined to invest our trust in, not in order to overcome this distrust, but to remain with it, remain within it, to dwell upon it, or to tarry with it. 
tarrying with the negative, tarrying with the distrust and the critique and the disbelief that is the condition of the existence of monotheism, seems to me to be an interesting identification of a moment in the structure of the theological life. But simply a moment. And it's a moment that if we try to make our home there, we will find ourselves becoming cynics. Let me be more specific. As I understand this statement, I don't see you seeing something very much different from radicalized or hyperbolic ideology critique, you know, a la Zizek, Lacan, post-Marxist, which the hyperbolic ideology critique doesn't actually hope in the truth because it sees ideology as constitutive of consciousness, constitutive of existence. That is, we must and we will and we must continually fabricate fictions for ourselves and act as though those fictions are true. And then the ideological critique comes in as a kind of unmasking locally of these ideologies, but without any hope really in the truth, without any genuine hope that a life beyond ideology is possible. And such ideology critique becomes, well, it is a kind of cynicism that masquerades as political activism. You know, I think of the way Zizek finishes that movie, the last movie, The Pervert's Guide to Ideology, where after all these really very depressing and disturbing statements about how, you know, human consciousness is constitutively ideological, he's seen a sinking off of the coast out in the Atlantic. He's one of these on the Titanic and he's going down, but he raises his arm and says, but we will fight on, we'll fight on. And I think that this is Zizek, he's winking, you know, which the movie maker is saying, oh, we have to have a hopeful moment at the end here. And then Zizek is really this great liberator and he's, you know, he's about emancipatory politics and so on. But if you listen to Zizek carefully, he's winking and he's saying, you know, let us continue to lie because without the lie, we don't exist. And this is cynicism. This cynicism, I think, is very dangerous. And it is the absolute enemy of the kind of theological radicalism that you're offering us or at least suggesting to us. So for in passages such as the following, for example, also from your paper, what guarantees more the establishing of a revolutionary society than real perseverance in the destruction of the old one? Right. So that this is a well-known thesis that it is the eschatological religions, the religions of hope who who mobilize the political will of the world in a way in which it has never before been mobilized and without revolution, reformation, uh, no modernity, and no, but without this eschatological monotheistic religion, no reformation, no revolution. Absolutely. So we have this, you know, we have this impulse to tear down what exists in front of us because we say it is not the truth, and we say that because we believe that the truth is beyond. The truth is beyond. It puts the present into judgment. This creates revolutionary power. Uh, and, and, and then you seem to wish to uh, to inhabit this place of revolution. Another passage from you, uh, speaking of messianism's double bind, while radically critiquing the existing order, it keeps that new order from developing a critical eye on itself. So you want to avoid the eschatological collapse into the fundamentalist uh, position where his own everything is up for critique, but his own position. So you want to have uh, a self-critical kind of uh, activity. But I think, in fact, the ideology that does not, the critique of ideology or the critique that, that does not hope in the truth uh, is, for that very reason, incapable of critiquing itself. Uh, and, and this is why I'm concerned uh, with, uh, with what you've presented us. Um, the ide ideological critique uh, must be grounded in a hope in the truth, and that hope in the truth has to be uh, an entirely unequivocal hope. That is, we must actually believe somewhere, we must be able to believe somewhere that, we, that existence, life in the truth, is possible. And because it's possible for us, then it is somehow necessary for us politically. And that's what motivates us. That's what mobilizes us. And if, if we, if rather than inhabiting that theological position, we rather stay in a place where uh, we're engaged in critique without the risk of hope, because of, I don't know, fundamentalism or something, uh, I don't know where we are other than in a place of cynicism. Uh, 
or even further, I think that you know, critique without hope is de is de demonic. Um, cynicism uh, presumes to master that which makes it possible. Yeah. So uh, this is the, this is the temptation of uh, of, uh, of critique, right? That it would actually get become a come to a point where it would assume uh, it would assume it would it would assume it would presume the right to close the horizon of questions uh, because its critique outstrips all question all, all possible answers and so it closes the horizon of questions and it remains in a place of radical critique without hope and i don't know how that is different than cynicism so in, in it, i would the way i would want to work towards uh, this uh, religious secularism rather than non-religious monotheism. And I think, as I said, it's going to be a Trinitarian uh, uh, secularism. Uh, that is, uh, this will be the secularism in which the God who is one dies on the cross. You know, God dies on the cross. He doesn't die in, uh, in the 19th century. Uh, we, we, are, we are the religion of the death of God. And the death of God cannot be understood except in a Trinitarian way that fundamentally destabilizes all monotheisms and all, uh, as it does, all polytheisms, uh, and brings us into a place that I don't think we've yet inhabited. Maybe what I'm suggesting is that we actually haven't really tried a Trinitarian secularism. We've been, we've had too much monotheistic secularism, and I'm wondering if we were to, if we were to risk one, what it would look like. And I, I have then just a few, three theses here, uh, which, which I think uh, are somehow uh, responses to you or alternative ways of articulating things that you are articulating. I have no difficulty with the history and, and so on. I, this I don't want to touch. Uh, on the contrary, I've learned from it. Um, you spoke, for example, of a very interesting way of how, uh, how, poly, how non monotheistic religions have no truth. I thought this was superb, actually. Non-monotheistic religions have no truth. So with monotheism, there is this separation which makes possible, you know, truth. That is, one can one can uh, say something about uh, the real, and at the same time, one could speak wrongly of it. One has enough space from it. And so I, I think this this way of articulating it highlights this continu this continuous evolution from uh, ancient monotheism to modernity, to the mo modern culture of critique. I would say, uh, I would have put it a little bit differently. I would say it, it, it has to do with nature, uh, that it's not God who dies in the modern age, it's nature. And our executioner was monotheism, that we are no longer, we, we cease to belong to a nature that could contain us, that could norm our life, uh, that, could in, that, could, that, that could be theophanic, uh, and that could uh, legitimate our social lives. We, we, that all ceased when God became located elsewhere. God was not natural. The God who creates the world is not himself a creation, which means now ontology has to be has to have at least two categories: one for everything that's natural and that's created, and now another ineffable, perhaps incomprehensible category for that which is beyond nature, which is spirit. And in this moment, I think. Nature dies for us in as much as we are no longer contained by it. And that is certainly how monotheism, I think, prepares the ground for political emancipation uh, and for ideological critique and for liberalism and for the kind of secularism that we know. But here's my second point. This critique, this space of negativity and emancipation uh, from nature is not a resting place for spirit. Now, this isn't... This is not a place where we can set up our tents. Yeah, we, we, th that would be entirely confused. Um, when it becomes that, hope has given way to cynicism. Uh, here I have in mind, for example, how hugely popular messianic thinking has become or in the last 20, 30 years in philosophy, how messianic thinking in French thought, for example, has become appropriated uh, by people like Derrida or Levinas, and then by the many, like the countless readers and followers of these French thinkers. And there is a curious thing about this philosophical messianism, uh, which is that it, on the one hand, it says it affirms of theology uh, this uh, tran this transcendence which places the present into critique in the most radical way. And for that reason, you know, the deconstructive power of theology is mobilized for a philosophical project. But on the other hand, it does not dare to hope 
that that transcendence could be real. Uh, because to do so would be to violate some sacred canons of philosophy or even be to become far too religious. So you have this curious, as you know, dif this infinitely deferred uh, eschaton, which my question is, is when you do that with the eschaton, don't you in fact become very conservative and just plainly affirming a status quo of critique without content? And then my third, uh, so the second point is that cynicism is, the critique is not a resting place. And the third point is that monotheic, monotheistic eschatology uh, is not enough. We need to go beyond this. Monotheistic eschatology gives us a truth beyond the world, an emancipate spirit from this one. But it leaves us vulnerable to, on the one hand, fanaticism, uh, as you've described it, and on the other hand, I say cynicism, uh, as, I've, as I've articulated it. A political theology capable of self-critique as I think you are, you are arguing for, that is a, a political theology capable of compassion, or maybe I should say charity there, it needs more than a God who is wholly other. You know, that's a kind of way of making him safely out of, this, out of the picture, right? You know, only God is God, and, which means, you know, let's not worry so much about that, that's not our business. Um, he, he's going to leave us alone because he doesn't really care that much about us, and meanwhile need to look after the world, right? Um, I think a political theology capable of self-critique or religious secularism needs a God who is both beyond everything and identified with everything. That is, somehow or other, this nature that died has to be resurrected. So a God who is invested in this world, even as he transcends it, or if we want, we'll speak of a religion that both invests in this world while never ceasing to hope in another one. And that, I think, has been the most difficult thing for modern uh, monotheistic religion to do, that is to invest in this world and at the same time to hope in another one, on the, on the, on the, on the experience that this could not possibly be uh, the end for us. So that would be a, a few remarks for discussion. <laughs> Break. We'll take uh, a short break, five yeah, minutes, maybe for coffee or a cookie, uh, <laughs> but be back in five minutes. So by listening to uh, uh, Dr. Kazel's uh, Reply. Well, if I have uh, something to reply, because it's you know, there are very profound questions, and you put, if I understood you well, a kind of um, how is it called um, uh, a religious secularism. That's that's your point. You defend this, and I defend the kind of non-religious monotheism. And you defend a religious secularism. And your main point is the question of cynicism. Because if, if, you, if you remain on that critical point, then you can destroy every truth claim someone makes without any hope of it. That, that, that's it. And, and I have no real answer to that, because I don't know. Most of the things I don't know. <laughs> um, but I understand a bit the question. You know, and, uh, uh, and I'm interested in cynicism because I wrote also on the cynicism of Jesus. <laughs> but then in the, you know, the, the, the cynical tradition, I understand you, the, the cynical tradition is a very noble tradition. <laughs> I like always to defend it. <laughs> Maybe that's my symptom. <laughs> and I have to love my symptom. Have that. <laughs> but you know, the cynics, the cynics means dark. Eh? Kynos in Greek means dark. That was that's the tradition from Plato on. That's kind of from Plato on. There are two traditions. There is the very serious tradition, which 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 is Neoplatonism, and which has just discovered the gram the delivered the grammar from uh, for for uh, Christianity and for the official thought. 
But Plato has, in the Academy of Plato, there were people who were in, in, in the so so Socrates, ironic mood, they were criticizing everything. Diogenes of Sinope, the, and, uh, and they were saying, don't worry, you, why thinking? Why, why just, just do, the things are what they are. Being is being, A is A. You should not, the truth is there everywhere. You should not, you should not too much uh, make, as we do, uh, difficult constructions and uh, with, with the whole apparatus, it's just there. And that's what Jesus does. Look at the flowers. What do the flowers? They do nothing. That's the kingdom of God, you know. So there is, there, there's, that cynical tradition is there. And that, and, and, and you, you have really the, the, the pointing there, that that's the critical tradition. In the name of critique, you can be conservative, as, as you can say I am a bit, in defending a kind of, because I'm, I'm in reserve to that hope, and I'm criticizing, and then you said, no, criticism means that point of negativity, which is, which, is, which is there in the cynics, that negative point, which says, don't worry, it's not what you think it is, it's something else, the kingdom of God is not what you think it is, it's just the flowers, that is impossible without any hope to the future. This Christianity, because Christianity, I, I, I dropped it, but I did, did mention nothing about Christianity because the, the, I think this kind of is, a, is, a, is a very problematic uh, religion because indeed it's not really monotheistic. It's, it's, it's the reinvention of, of religion into, into monotheism. But seen from that point, Christianity is an eschatological religion. That means it's built not on the on the idea of the law, but the idea on the Messiah. To, 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 to rephrase it very uh, briefly, uh, original monotheism is the religion of the law. If you follow the law, then God will you give prosperity and a great people, and you will be happy. That's it. But, as, as in any culture, this, this does not... This was not really the solution for the discontent, which, which is which is which is un unavoidable in culture, and that's the new idea came into being that God Himself will come in. He will He will rearrange things because man is not able to be in in direct line with God. God will come by His Messiah. He will end His creation, build up a new creation. And he will reveal himself totally, apocalyptic, eschatological. That, that's it. And Christianity is dealing with that hope. But then, that's the point. And there we, I think, uh, in a certain way, we agree. There is, there is a problem with Christianity. Because Christianity, uh, and that's the dubiosity, you mentioned it a bit. Christianity says, Christianity deals with with. with with, uh, with black and white at the same time. Because Christianity says uh, it, it deals with that kind of critical tradition which hopes for a new realm. The kingdom of God, as Jesus called that. That means things are not what they are. The truth is not what it is. The truth is different from what we think the truth is. That's why God himself, the truth himself, will send someone and will arrange things. The truth itself will come in, and we are hoping for that. That's one tradition. Christianity has taken that tradition, but has said that hope has been realized in Jesus, in Christ. The Messiah is not the one who will come. The, mes the Messiah is the one who has come, which, which is radically different, because then that, that, that's why Christianity has... It's very difficult. It's a difficult narrative because it has to. It believes that we are beyond the realm of finitude, the realm of sin, the realm of of, of the first creation, which which is definitely the case because people die, we, people we make sins, there is corruption everywhere, and that's why Christianity has found a way. That's the genius of Christianity to deal with both at the same time. Christianity can deal with the fact. Christ still has to come, 
because it had, had rearranged this narrative a bit by saying Christ has been realized, death has been conquered, but, but Christ has gone for a moment to the Father and he will come back. And we are living, we are living in that moment that will be there between his first um, coming and his second coming. And he will soon come back and that soon lasts very long. But you see, qua timing, the, the, the structure of time is double there. The truth is there, the truth is not. And I think this is very important to notice that. Because you can criticize Christianity for that, but don't be too fast in that. Because we moderns have inherited precisely that from Christianity. That the Holy Mother is a virgin and the, the mother of, of, of God. If I say that on, the solace, on, on, on an, uh, an, an application moment, that, that, that's, not, that's not the center of our Christianity. But we have inherited the structure of Christianity. We, we moderns, and that's postmodernism, we can say at the same time the truth and the non-truth. The, the truth realized and the truth to come. And we, that, that's the structure, and that's cynicism, you know. If, if you go a bit too much to that, if you know that, you can become cynic. And that's, that's, why, I hear, I, that's why I don't know. <laughs> Excuse me. I, I have no answer. That's, for me, it's a problem. We have inherited that structure from Christianity. And we can we can we can uh, we can think yeah we are against Christianity but that's stupid you, you could not be against something when you think about that we we have no the choice to be against it we have to think modernity as an, as that what as has inherited Christianity in its grammar and the dubiosity of Christian Christian of of the dubiosity of modernity becomes clear in that old tradition that is still persisting in us. So, I, I don't know. I, I, you can, I, I am very sympathetic to the hope, and I think this is in, it's in, impossible to avoid it, but precisely in that hope, there is a big danger. And I think, in my thinking, I'm just stressing too much that danger, danger. and I have reasons for that. If you look at the ideologies of the 20, 19th, 20th century, they are all ideologies of hope, right wing, left wing, communism, fascism. Fascism is a socialism of hope, where a people finally becomes itself. And that hope is taken serious and has become totalitarian. So that hope, in the name of that hope, that hope must be, must be criticized as such. So, so even in the culture of hope, we need a kind of opening that protects us to the imaginary structure that is part of that hope. And that's why I, I, I'm stressing a bit tradition, not because I'm traditional on the level of content, but we have that reflection. Tradition gives us a kind of hybrid uh, collection of situations in which that same problem has been dealt with by other times, in other situations, positive, negative, and you, you have to behold that kind of reference. That, that's, that's, the, that's why the Christian tradition must, must save its tradition. And, and, and tradition is always in hybrid, most of the time very bad thing, because the people, the tradition of people, that's, that's not, it's not magnificent, you know, what, what the church has done in history, it's fantastic, but, it's, but the, the, there are many black pages in the book they have, they have written. But they have, you have to keep them. That's very important. You have to keep your black pages to, 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 yeah, to fight against cynicism also. And now I really don't know if I have answered any of your questions. <laughs> I was just right, afraid right. of it. And just <laughs> you moved around and made me feel <laughs> cynic. But I would like to hear from that. Yeah, yeah, maybe if we could... Uh, we have uh, a little bit more than 20 minutes before uh, 8, so uh, let's begin with that. Uh, wow, that was quite something. First of all, I want to you know, say thank you to both of you. Uh, this was a very, very illuminating session. Thank you. I want to ask one question to each of you. Uh, pertaining to Marx, uh, uh, 
grounding of truth. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you were arguing in favor of criticism, but that criticism was somewhat grounded in the tradition. In in the tradition. In a tradition. Ah, uh, tradition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If that is so, then that will never culminate in cynicism, because. Uh, criticism can lead to cynicism if it is grounded in subjectivity, for instance, Nietzsche. But a criticism that is grounded in tradition assumes a certain level of objectivity to begin with. So I have difficulty uh, understanding commentators' uh, uh, take that, that criticism necessarily ends in cynicism, first point. Second point, I guess that I totally agree with uh, commentators' uh, 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 observations that that there should be hope because if the if the if if it is a rational inquiry, not even you know theological, but if there is no hope, then it is it is a uh, it is a fruitless exercise at the end of the day. But then. We also have an epistemological obligation to differentiate between hope and certitude. Because one thing, the beautiful thing about hope is that it, it has a teasing aspect. It may come true, it may not come true. So if I hope for something, the chances you can talk in terms of probability and possibility being very high or being low but it's not the same as certitude. But I think that, that uh, and correct me if I am wrong, that your presentation of hope almost borders on certitude, that it is a certain thing. Uh, and so if that is so, uh, do I understand your, your observations right, or am I missing something? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Excellent points. The first one I found, uh, more puzzling than the second, you said uh, a criticism grounded criticism grounded in tradition will never become cynical. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, uh, but certainly the criticism that becomes cynical is a criticism that has uh, uh, made itself uh, into an end. And the means has become an end. So I, I don't think that's particularly traditional, but I do think that is a characteristic of a kind of. Uh, 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 you know, a monotheism without God or something like that, which you could sort of describe modernity as a monotheism without God, without without transcendence. Uh, so it, a criticism that takes itself as its uh, as an end rather than a means, if you want to put it that way, is a is a criticism that is vulnerable to cynicism, which is, is a criticism that is cynical. Uh, and I think that the point uh, about tradition uh, is very difficult because I'm not entirely sure that I would agree that criticism grounded in tradition is safe from becoming cynical. I'm not sure about that. Uh, but certainly I was not saying, uh, I, was not, I was not hearing in Mark uh, a defense of a, of a criticism which is, uh, you know, wholly traditional. Uh, you know, and this, I mean, I, whose tradition anyway? Which tradition are we talking about? There's lots of, there are several on the table here. So the question about tradition is a difficult one because criticism in a certain way is a criticism of the tradition. This is pre predominantly what it criticizes, mm -hmm. as Mark said. You know, it's not God who's being uh, judged here. It's uh, our, our, our speaking of him, our thinking of him. Uh, and then the fear is, of course, that there is nothing but our speaking of him, our thinking of him. There is no God, but the, the God that lives in the lies that we tell about him. Um, but the, so that, that's, that's just to clarify what I was saying about criticism. With regard to hope and certainty, mm, I think they're very, very different things. I mean, certainty is a cognitive category, right? You know, you talk, you even spoke about certainty and evidence, and uh, it's a, it has to do with cognition and knowledge. Uh, hope is, a, is, is an, an investment of your existence in something over which you have no mastery. Uh, and in a certain way, there's something absolute about hope because uh, it precisely refuses the hoper. The hoper, the hopeful, the hopeful <laughs> refuses to actually uh, to have mastered the situation to such a degree that despair is a real option. Yeah, despair is, settles down and says, "I guess I really know what's going on, and therefore I despair." 
And, and, and so I, I think that hope is a very interesting structure. Theological hope, I do not find it particularly well understood. I think, in fact, it has been distorted deeply by modernity. It has become optimism. And this is not at all what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Obama's hope, no way. Yeah? <laughs> the, and the difference between Obama's hope or optimism is that such hope presumes the means to achieve the end. That's precisely what it's affirming. You know, we can do it. You know, we have it, right? Theological hope finds its absoluteness precisely in its abjuring any means, any mastery of the means to achieve the end. For this reason, hope is entirely at home with thoroughgoing pessimism. Yeah? So that the, hope, the, the hopeful uh, understands the pessimist very well. In fact, the hopeful uh, is not expecting to see uh, the means of his salvation uh, produce themselves around him in some kind of recognizable fashion. And for that reason, his hope is absolute. So it's a kind of risking of oneself entirely, a trusting uh, entirely in uh, what is to come on the basis of what has been. Uh, and so such a, such a hope is compatible with pessimism, is not compatible with cynicism. Cynicism presumes to know more than mm -hmm. the hopeful would ever presume. But it's linked to pessimism, your hope. Yes, it's fully compatible yeah. with yeah. pessimism. Um, yeah, I would. Would you like to add something on the, uh, Mark? Very, well, I'm, I'm interested in. I'm very just briefly. <coughs> well, I'm, I think it's. The same question was addressed to you, to both of you. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I, I don't know, Raj, if the if tradition is the the remedy against cynicism, and I I meant Mark more like truth grounded in practice. Like McIntyre, for instance, yeah. argues. So, so it's not a blind uh, acceptance of tradition. It's two conceptions of truth. One that is more Aristotelian and McIntyrean, that truth is grounded in practice, yeah. whereas the other is Enlightenment view that we construct the truth and that truth is not grounded in practice. And then, yeah. Again, I don't know. <laughs> Imagine my Well, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking uh, because the, um, that, that depends on the definition of truth. If you, if you refer to McIntyre, there is a kind of truth you have to realize. But, but what I mean is that the reference to truth in our tradition, from, from the Greeks to so on, and, and including the tradition of religion, is always a dubious, always a double bind tradition. The, 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 there is always there's a tragic structure in the condition in which we live, because we cannot avoid to refer to truth, and truth is inherently dangerous. And if I hear, if I hear Psalm, he, he must say that even the hope must be pessimistic. So you, you have always to, to, to include some mechanisms that you don't think that you will realize truth. That, that, that's why you have, to, you have to leave your hope open. And I hear in you Benjamin, eh, Walter Benjamin, in, which, which is a Jewish thinker, which, which, which is the, the most modern version of the, of the Jewish uh, uh, eschatological thinking. That you you, ha you have to always to 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 and and that's that, that's what you said that's my conservatism but it you have to leave open something that 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 is even other than your hope that's different of McIntyre you know that's that that well but that that's that's different because that 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 means that in that the in 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 the way you you realize your world. You have, to, you have to build a kind of culture around that kind of openness of your hope. That, that, that's why I see that that's the mission of, of monotheistic religion. It's, it's very, uh, it, it's Walter Benjamin in a certain way. Monotheism has a sense because man, monotheism can help us to protect us against the, that kind of, of, of all too easy idea that you can realize our modern pro project. We, we, we need a kind of of reinvestment of the tragic, the tragic tendency. 
That's why I always refer to monotheism and to the Greek tradition. I read the, the monotheistic tradition very, very Greek, very tra it's a tragic structure. We will never have the solution for it, and that's fantastic. <laughs> that's, that's, you no, know, that's democracy. We will never have, we will never have a society in which we have solved our problems, and it's for us moderns extremely easy, difficult to think that, and we know that. We know that. Fortunately, we will never be in heaven. Fortunately, thanks God, we will never be in heaven. But <laughs> but but how to exp how to express that, you know, within our grammar, because we know heaven that. That, that that must be that must be that, that must be hell. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you very much for the presentation. Both of you. I have two questions. One on the best of the front, and the other for both of you. Uh, first of all, um, I would like to uh, kind of disagree a little bit, not completely, on the thesis that Kant kind of separated uh, uh, religion from faith. He invented kind of faith uh, because I think. Um, uh, the critical, even critical paradigm comes actually from, from Kant as a reaction against an uh, over catechetization of a uh, kind of approach towards God that was developed by Henry of Ghent and Duns Scotus, where God became kind of subject to metaphysics and theology became subject to metaphysics. So um, Kant wanted to operate an opening in that, and uh, although that was applied only to pure reason, but I think you only need to make one step from that and apply his critique and make kind of elaborate the critique of pure religion. Um, and in that sense, I think um, Kant is the founder of, of maybe what you have said of, uh, of, of hope as not of, of hope instead of as opposed to uh, criticism as being a resting place and a criticism or that can degenerate into a cynicism. What Kant did is he opened that uh, had, uh, um, hermetic, uh, cataphatic approach in order, to, in, in virtue, uh, because he believed that there was a bigger truth. Um, so how how do you how how would your reaction be to that? Yeah. 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 And the second question, yeah. Ah, this vitatio, huh? Against the vitatio. Who has invented that? No, the other the other one is is, is, is simple. It's just any of, you, any of you knows Nicolas Bergayev. Of course. Yeah. yeah. Okay, no because I think, I think this whole, the whole talk reminds me of his book, The Divine and the Human, where he suggests a kind of uh, um, religious secularism and suggests a critique of religion and so forth. So I think that um, some of these help with right, the question. Thank you. Well, when she talks about uh, Henry of Ghent, I am from Ghent, you know, but I know Henry of Ghent is the most difficult thinker in medieval times. So, and, and, and Don Scott is, is, is easy either. So, but, but to answer your question, um, well, when I, it, it, my, my intention was not to criticize Kant, because it was not a lecture on Kant. I would defend Kant, but I have a lecture on Kant. Kant is very, I, and, and I would concentrate my 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 notion of faith then uh, on the notion of Vernunftglaube, a rational belief, which is which is extremely intelligent and which 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 I embrace in a certain way. Because, but I was talking about the kind of vulgarization, the effect of Kant in the in the main discourse. You know, in the main discourse, Kant has given a kind of of, of um, approval to the fact that we solved the big problem we had, science and religion are not the same. And nobody was happy with Kant in, in uh, 1794 when, when the, the, the critique in Haupt der Grenzen der Bloße Vernunft was, was, was there. But 10 years later, Protestants, Catholics, they accepted all. The, the Pope nowadays accepts what he would never accept without Kant, that is, that science is not his, his science is not his thing, you know, and that, and, and I'm, I'm talking about this, and you can, yeah. I can criticize what I'm saying about the Kantian faith with Kant, I, I know that, you know, because Kant is more, more intelligent than that, so that, 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 but the, the fact, the, 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 
in fact, in the in the global discourse, not in the most intelligent discourse, but in the way it faith appears in in the ones who defend it and not in the newspapers and everywhere, is that distinction between science and faith. And he is he is, he is used for that in, in a certain way. And that's and I think this is I think this is the ground the crisis. And I say it because everyone thinks the crisis of religion is that people do not no longer believe. And I think this is. This is definitely not true. Modern people believe extremely. They, they believe you can. Otherwise, there will not be commercials. You can, you can, you can sell everything to modern people. You can even sell them Coca-Cola. Imagine. <laughs> so, so what, what's the problem with? So they believe everything. Everything they believe, and and that's the problem. And that's why, that, and that's why Christianity has to intervene in that. You know, and and it doesn't. That, that's a pity. It doesn't, and, and that, that for 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 a lot of reasons, you know, there were the power in this. There is Rome, and that 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 that's that's not a story. Why precisely they don't do that? That's that's an interesting story, but maybe it's too late because I, I find it a pity that that tradition would be lost because we moderns are fighting with religion. That that's a, we, we don't like that. But, but when in the 90s religious fundamentalism raised, that everyone said, but how is it possible? How is this possible? It is possible. That means there is something in the religion we don't we don't understand. Do you think that the, this fight happens because uh, there's kind of opposition between uh, the human and the divine uh, instead of being in harmony, like the figure of Christ is symbolic of the union between the human and the divine the imminent and the transcendent. So would this fight be symbolical of, of this relation between the imminent and the transcendent? I don't the natural and supernatural, but uh, uh, we fight against against religion or against uh, something transcendent because it's in the way. No, the that's way not way. the way I see it. The, uh, the, to, in, in, in the way I, I would anal analyze the, the religious fundamentalism, I would not stress religion as such. I would stress modernity. It's a symptom of modernity. It's a symptom of freedom. I, I wrote another text because that's the first chapter in a book, and I, will, I have a, a chapter on bin Laden. And my, my, my thesis is definitely bin Laden, he's a modern guy. He's a Cartesian, absolutely. And he uses religion to hide his modernism, to hide the, 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 the kind of um, the abysmal ground, the lack of ground of modernism. He is free. He, he is the man who stands at distance from the world. He, says, he sees the world and he says, that world is not good, I want another one. That means he is in the position of a modern man, cynical, who's outside of everything, and then he uses God to say, but I'm in the name of truth. He repeats the movement of Luther. Who stands there who said I'm free it's freedom who is the base of my religion and then says I cannot do but that you know that 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 he, he is afraid from that freedom and he uses religion to hide that 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 lack of ground of freedom and that that's why you need people like Kierkegaard who within the religious tradition show that kind of lack of ground and you can do that with with, 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 with Christian tradition. It, it, it's there. You know that that would be the the way I avoid your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think we will have to stop here. So let's thank again our two speakers. <laughs> and, uh, thanks to you uh, for coming tonight and stay uh, tuned because there will be more of you. <laughs> Thank you.